Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 370. In the news this week, got some great news actually from the Scottish Rite Journal. They frequently review books and they went ahead and they reviewed It's Business Time, Adapting a Corporate Path for Freemasonry, the book that John and I wrote back a few months ago. And we did not solicit the book to them and we got wind that they were going to review it just a few weeks ago. And I was a little nervous. I didn't know what they were going to say about what we had written, but it turns out they liked it. Uh, it, The way I read it, it almost sounds as if they endorsed some of the ideas that we came up with. So I should say we didn't come up with those ideas. We adapted them for Freemasonry. So thank you so much to the Scottish Rite Journal for your kind words about the book. Anybody interested in that, uh, stay tuned and we'll tell you how to get that book a little later on. I want to give another shout out to the Philolathes magazine. Uh, Their latest issue came out. It has a pretty cool rundown of the latest Kotor Coronati conference that happened there at the Washington Masonic Memorial. Brother Scott S. Duball, who is our state education officer, actually got to go down to that, and uh, he said it was a great conference, and it was just nice to read a little bit about what uh, Sean Iyer had said about it. So uh, if you're not a member of the Philolathes magazine, I suggest you become a member. Uh, You can do that by just going to freemasonry.org. They're also on Facebook. So I'm recording this episode on Super Tuesday. I just am going to be super busy the rest of the week. I'm actually going to be out of town for the next few days, so I won't actually have any time to put this together over the weekend like I normally do. I hope you guys are all doing okay with election results, and I hope you guys got out there to vote and exercise your rights. And remember, if your candidate won, awesome. If they didn't win, it's okay. Don't go crazy. Get involved and help to change the world in your direct circle of influence. Because of the condensed time I have to put this episode together this week, we're going to go ahead and get right into the pieces right after this. The Whence Came You podcast is brought to you through the generous support of Masonic Revival, contemporary Masonic designs made for today's Freemason. You don't have to settle for throwing a plain old square and compass on anything anymore. Now you get something truly designed and truly wonderful. Whether it's aprons, awesome pins, and wonderful neckwear, bow ties, ties, pocket squares, you name it, Masonic Revival has it. Head on over to MasonicRevival.com and check out what they have to offer. And make sure if you see Brother Edgar, tell him thanks for helping bring this program to all of you. And this program is also brought to you by all of you, those of you who support this program. We can't do it without you and your donations and all of your assistance, so thank you so much. To find out more about how you can assist this program, head on over to wcypodcast.com and click on Support the Show. There you can make direct donations, sign up to be a monthly contributor, a fellow, or even a producer. And thanks very much to everybody for donating. So the first piece I have for you this week is called the 24-inch gauge and the circadian rhythm. Now, I've read something similar before. I don't think this is a repeat read, but if it is, don't bust my chops too bad. The 24-inch gauge and the circadian rhythm by Don Lavender. The 24-inch gauge, one of the working tools of masonry, teaches us to make the best use of our time. In a 24-hour period, we learn that eight hours should be devoted to the service of God and a worthy, distressed brother, eight hours in our usual vocation, and eight hours for rest and refreshment. Early masons who determined how to best use their time may not have known all of the ramifications of the 24-hour cycle. A study conducted by the National Institute of Mental Health reveals some remarkable facts about the 24-hour internal clock, or circadian rhythm as it is known scientifically. The internal clock runs whether we are hungry or full, and whether it is dark or light. A scientist in the Antarctic where it is light for months at a time, went to bed when he felt sleepy. He discovered that it was 15 minutes later each day until the 28th day when sleepy time reverted to the usual time and began over again. Even plants in the dark open and close their leaves at regular intervals. Newborn babies acquire the circadian rhythm within 16 weeks or less, 
birds and lizards that were raised in soundproof rooms with temperature and light control came by the circadian rhythm without ever seeing daylight or any other living creature. Scientists in confinement in caves where there was no light soon adhered to the 24-hour internal clock even though their conception of time was flawed. Attempts have been made to change the cycle to 12, 18, or 48 hours, but those who participated in the experiment became irritable and were error-prone. Jet lag is related to circadian rhythm and results when the normal rhythm is upset. The symptoms familiar to most travelers include fatigue, tendency to error, and general malaise. In addition to the circadian 24-hour cycle, there are longer cycles known as infradian cycles. The female 29-day cycle is one of these, but men also have a similar cycle which is not as pronounced. The cycle in the male is of similar length and was confirmed by hormonal studies. Dr. Franz Hallberg of the University of Minnesota made some interesting conclusions from his years of study on the subject. Among his findings were the fact that deaths from anterior sclerosis were greatest in January. Accidental deaths were more prevalent in July and August, and suicides greater in May. Considering again the circadian 24-hour cycle, Dr. Charles Seisler of Boston's Brigham and Women's Hospital determined from his studies that more humans die around 6 in the morning, more heart attacks and strokes occur around 9 in the morning, and peak onset of labor in women is between 1 and 7 in the morning. Both doctors concluded that physical performance is poorest between 2 and 6 in the morning. As a result, there are more one-car accidents during that period. One study accented the physical variations daily when they gave rats an identical drug dosage at two different times of day. Of the rats given the drug during their active cycle, a high percentage died while those given the same dosage during their rest cycle had only one death out of ten. Such studies have led to the speculation that there may be a day when doctors will maintain a sort of circadian map for every patient. Information in that map would determine the best time for most effective medication or treatment. Dr. Seisler, has been successful in altering some faulty circadian patterns by use of light, much brighter than average room lighting, applying it scientifically to achieve the desired changes. The treatment has been applied to patients suffering from depression, fatigue, or sleep disorders. Although there is still much to be learned, the presence of rhythmic cycles in humans and animals is well established. Our Masonic forefathers who used the 24-inch gauge to measure and divide wisely our time, may not have known about the circadian rhythm, but they certainly recognized the importance of adhering to a schedule for personal well-being. Now that's the end of that piece. I hope you enjoyed that. What's interesting about this piece is recent revelations and documents that I've read which talk about circadian rhythm even among those who lived in the Middle Ages. But in the Middle Ages, there were other practices like people waking up in the middle of the night and going out on the town and then coming back home for a second going to bed. Very interesting stuff indeed. Illustrious brother Toddy Creason just finished a series on Ben Franklin on his blog, From Labor to Refreshment. And Ben Franklin was famous for keeping a 24-hour schedule for his days. I do the same thing. I have a general outline of the 24 hours of every day, Monday through Sunday. And what I do is I try to adhere to that. That way I can get the most done and I'm always working or sleeping, or abiding by whatever the schedule states. So just some things to think about. If you would like an example of a 24-hour schedule, uh, I can certainly send you what mine looks like. If you'd like, um, it probably won't help you out much, but perhaps you can pop it in Excel and uh, do something similar to help yourself out. I often mention the fact that the reading of the minutes may be one of the less exciting parts of a Masonic meeting. Personally, I live for it. I live for it to be over with, that is. One of the bodies I belong to, in my opinion, does it right. At that meeting, we always have a dinner beforehand, and the secretary sets out copies of the minutes and any other pertinent material, such as financial statements, on each table. During the time before the meeting, each member has a chance to read through the handouts. Then, during the meeting, without a reading, we vote on approval. It doesn't always go this way. In my own Blue Lodge, God bless them, we still have the 
ever-present droning, uh, I mean, reading of the minutes at each meeting. To add to the frenzy of excitement this creates, we also read the name of every officer, in every station, every visitor, and every single word of every petition. I remember one night in particular when we had multiple petitions. By the end of the evening, I almost had the entire document committed to memory and would have had I not fallen asleep. When I became senior warden, I sat in the West close enough to the junior deacon that we could converse during the meeting. Together, we felt we could solve the problems of the world, so solving the problems of the lodge was a piece of cake. Every single meeting, when the reading of the minutes came up, Alan, not his real name of course, would turn around to me and say, when I get up there in the East, we're not going to do this. He encouraged me to do it before he got there, but I told him I just wanted to get through my year unscathed and would leave it up to him to make the radical change. Years passed. I went through the East, only scathed a little bit, but I survived. Then I moved to that most coveted of all Masonic positions, past master, and waited for Alan to take the helm. And take it he did, full of the vigor of his still youthful age and the expectation of the exciting year he had planned. I was nearly giddy as I went to his first meeting, knowing he was about to shake the Masonic world. I sat in great anticipation as Alan opened the meeting. Then, in an instant, my hopes for a better world came crashing down as he turned to the secretary and said, Brother Secretary, you will read the minutes. I nearly had an out-of-body experience as we droned through the meeting and Alan embraced the usual pomp and circumstance, more pomp than circumstance actually, of all the meetings and masters that had come before him. After the meeting, I rushed up to him and asked why he had fallen into the routine he seemed to abhor back in his junior deacon days. His answer sounded a little familiar. I just want to get through my year unscathed, he said. Change is difficult, brothers, and the penalty for attempting it may be a good, sound scathing, which many times starts with the words, In my day, we did it this way. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right, I hope you enjoyed that great segment from illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. It is absolutely one of my favorites that he's done. I laughed out loud at some of the points in it. It was brilliant. And uh, it speaks to us, right? Because things don't always go the way we want. And when we want to change something and we get put on the spot, what do we do? So we get scared sometimes and we kind of backtrack and we don't want to have that scathing as Steve talked about. But it's important because change is necessary and sometimes it hurts. So because I got a little bit behind posting these Masonic Minutes, instead of going every other week, we're going to have another one next week and it's another great one. So you're not going to want to miss it. So a huge thanks goes out to illustrious Brother Harrison for another wonderful Masonic Minute and uh, thanks for the laugh. But also, I needed that reassurement. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to WCYPodcast.com, you can click on Direct Donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on in the beginning of the program. Of course, you can make that one-time donation or you can sign up to be a monthly 
contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com, but also we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beard and Skin Care. He's been so generous. If you head to WCYPodcast.com, click on More, then click on Banker's Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products, skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more than go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to onit.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with john t ruark it is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success so check that out on amazon you can click right to it you can get it on audible kindle or in print even on ibooks and last but not least i want to ask you to check out the great books program you'll see the banner for it on the left hand side intellectual linear progression use the promo code wcy or you can just click on that link there and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from scott hambrick about how awesome the program is so that's it i hope you guys enjoy and Thank you so much for helping us out. The next piece I have for you this week is actually by somebody that we mentioned earlier in the show, Brother Todd E. Crease in 33rd Degree, a close friend, brother, mentor, all those things to so many of us. He wrote a piece that was fairly viral this last week called The Owl, the Dollar Bill, and the Freemasons. Now, there were some great scholarly articles put together by the likes of none other than Brent S. Morris talking about certain things on the dollar bill, the all-seeing eye, the pyramid, that kind of thing. This is a little bit different. And uh, I would encourage you to check out the graphics that illustrious brother Creason has put into the article. And if you don't have time to do that, if you're on the app, of course, you can download the paper right to your phone. And uh, the images are all inlaid into the article. We'll have that right there in the uh, extras. So here we go. The Owl, the Dollar Bill, and the Freemasons by Midnight Freemasons founder Todd E. Creason, 33rd Degree. While I was over at the annual Grand Lodge Convocation in Springfield, Illinois last month, I found an enormous book on symbology on the clearance rack at Barnes & Noble. Of course, I bought it. You can't have too many books on symbolism, right? Last night, I ran across a very detailed description of how the owl has been historically used as a symbol. It reminded me of a conversation I had with a Freemason a few years ago after I'd done a presentation. This mason claimed that there were two evidences of Masonic influence on the dollar bill. One was the back of the Great Seal of the United States, the well-known unfinished pyramid and all-seeing eye. That's perhaps one of the most roundly misunderstood and misinterpreted symbols of all time, and about as Masonic in origin as a ham sandwich. The other evidence was the little owl hidden in the upper right-hand corner. I knew that was there, but... That was the first time it had been suggested to me that it was quote-unquote Masonic in origin. I can remember the first time that little owl was pointed out to me. I was still in grade school, and our teacher pointed it out to the class one day. She told us it was a symbol of wisdom, and that's why it was included in the design. She also said that little details like that made it all the harder for anybody to try and copy a dollar bill. 
But the owl isn't a Masonic symbol. It is associated more with the Illuminati. Robert Johnson wrote a very good piece about that some years ago, the owl and Freemasonry on the Midnight Freemasons. It wasn't easy to sell my new friend on the idea that neither the back of the Grand Seal of the United States or the owl had any strong Masonic ties. He was a true believer that they did. I do not believe I was successful in convincing him. And he's not alone in believing the Great Seal of the United States is Masonic. I hear Masons who should know better make that claim all the time, and I stopped trying to correct them on it a decade ago. However, I never saw the owl on the dollar bill. It never looked like an owl to me. From the first time our teacher pointed it out to us in class up to this day, when I see that little engraving in the upper right-hand corner of the dollar bill, I see the exact same thing. I've shown few people over the years what I see, and they say once they saw it, they can never see the owl again. Turn that dollar bill over and have a close look at it. Do you see it yet? Is your mind blown? I never saw an owl. I saw a skull and crossbones. I was holding the dollar bill under the projector for the teachers so the class could see it on the wall. So I saw it upside down the first time. Once you see the skull, you can't unsee it. To me, it looks more like a skull upside down than an owl right side up. And the skull and crossbones? Well, that does have some Masonic symbolic meaning, as we all know. For those Masonic conspiracy theorists out there, you can consider this an early Christmas gift. You're welcome. Run with it. Now, as anybody who studies symbols knows, and I'm strictly an amateur, symbols always have these dual meanings. It would not surprise me in the least to find out that this duality, owl one way and skull the other, was intentional by the engraver. The owl, a symbol of wisdom and intellect, and the skull, the symbol of death and or new life. It's interesting to think about anyway. So now that you've seen it, what do you think? Owl or skull? Or nothing at all? Toddy Creason, 33rd degree. Founder. So what do you see when you look at that dollar bill? I have to admit that uh, it does look like a skull and crossbones when you flip it upside down. It's, uh, it's kind of difficult to unsee once you have seen it, as he says. If you want to talk to Todd about this or uh, maybe explain some symbols further or carry a conversation, you can reach out to him. He's at webmaster at toddcreason.org, but you can also find him at his blog, From Labor to Refreshment, at blogspot.com. That's it for this week. I know it's a shorter episode. I do apologize for that. But like I said, I've got some pressing business that I have to fly out of town for. I just won't have enough time to put it together this weekend. So with that, I'd like to invite you all to keep coming back to the midnightfreemasons.org or .com, whichever. I think we have them both there. So uh, midnightfreemasons.com three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for new articles all the time, guys. They're always there for you. They're web optimized, so they look great on your phone. So Feel free to check those out. If you like podcasts, I know you do because you're listening to one. I say it all the time. Check out the Masonic Roundtable. We switched nights. We used to be on a different night, but now we're on Thursdays at 9.30 Eastern. So that's 8.30 Central. And that, again, is on Thursday evenings. It just works out a little bit better for all of us. Coincidentally, I've only made one or two shows on this Thursday night now. I've actually missed a few. I missed last week, but... We had Brother P.D. Newman on talking about his book, Alchemically Stoned, where he uh, does some great investigative work regarding hallucinogenics, entheogens, that kind of thing, and uh, rituals and rites. A fantastic episode. I urge you all to check that out. This upcoming week, we've got some great stuff happening on the Masonic Roundtable again. And shocker, I may not be on that episode either due to the same pressing business that I have to go out of town for. If I'm absent, I do apologize, but no doubt the Knights of the Roundtable will prevail as they always do. So uh, check us out again Thursday night, 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central. That's it, guys. I want to say a huge thanks goes out to all of you for continuing to listen. And you know what, guys? Years ago when we started this podcast, I asked you guys to leave me some ratings on iTunes. I never check those things. And I just looked the other day. You know, this is just something that I put together every week, like clockwork. And I just I put this show out there, labor of love. And I, I know there's guys out there that might not like the show or whatever. But I got to say, we have a five-star rating on iTunes. I was blown away. So thank you guys so much for, for leaving a great reviews and making us a five-star podcast on iTunes. A huge 
huge honor. Thanks for listening. So until next week, stay on the level. For Wince Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 